Story recapped here. Today I'm going to explain a sci-fi and fantasy show called Love, Death and Robots Ice Age. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. A young couple moves into their new apartment. As Rob, the husband, brings a few boxes up into the place, his wife, Gail, tells him about a funky old refrigerator in the corner that the landlord left behind. Rob finds it fascinating, noting how the motor is above instead of underneath, like refrigerators these days. Since hot air rises, he comments that it doesn't make sense to put the motor underneath, allowing the hot air it produces to go up the refrigerator. However, Gail barely pays attention, and she simply agrees to the things Rob says. She then brings out a bottle of wine and asks her husband if he wants to drink. Rob gets excited and opens the old fridge to get some ice. However, the freezer is bulked up with frost, but he still manages to get a little cube of ice. The couple then makes a short toast to their new life together. Before Rob could take a sip of his drink, he notices something inside the ice. He takes it out of the glass and shows it to Gail, asking her to confirm what's inside the ice cube. Gail looks closer and becomes just as surprised as her husband. Wanting to confirm what she saw, Gail grabs a magnifying glass to inspect the ice cube closely. Surprisingly, inside it is a miniature mammoth with spears in its body. Gail wonders if there are more of these things in the freezer, so she opens it. She quickly takes out the junk inside and gets shocked by what she sees. With this, Rob takes a peek and comments there's a lost civilization in the refrigerator. True enough, the freezer contains a miniature working medieval city. Everything inside moves so fast, with the little people going through their day normally, unaffected by the two giants hovering near their city. In disbelief, Gail claims that what's happening doesn't make sense, and Rob agrees. She then clarifies that they're seeing an early medieval city, when woolly mammoths died out sometime in the late Neolithic period. Rob shrugs it off and simply agrees with his wife to hide his ignorance. Later on, Rob buries the frozen mammoth in a pot of dirt. Rob seems sad about it, so Gail lightens up the mood and says it'll probably make for a good fertilizer. Curiosity takes over, and the two check the freezer again. To their surprise, everything has changed drastically. What used to be a medieval city is now a modernized place during the Industrial Revolution. Factories and railroads are built, covering the freezer's sky with smoke. The couple knows that they've only been gone for 10 minutes, but decades have already gone by for the miniature people. With this, Gale theorizes that time moves differently inside the freezer. As they witness the Industrial Revolution at great speed, Rob is disappointed that they missed the Renaissance period. He notices two miniature men sitting by a building under construction and wonders if the people perceive them as gods. However, the men are actually making fun of them, seeing them as weird faces in the sky that are staring at the city. One man even comments that he's tired of seeing the broccoli that's stuck in Gale's teeth. Seconds later, modernized buildings are erected. Rob notices things flying around, and Gale identifies them as airplanes. As more skyscrapers are built, Gale believes that the miniature people have reached the present time. Rob confirms this when he sees a Starbucks store and comments that the cafe really pops out everywhere. Just then, he notices something weird, so he takes a closer look. Suddenly, a missile falls into the middle of the city and explodes. The explosion blinds Rob, making him back away and fall onto the floor. Gail helps him up and tells him to calm down, but Rob panics, exclaiming that tactical nukes are exploding in their freezer. However, Rob's face is as red as a tomato, and Gail could barely keep a straight face. As the freezer explodes with huge nuclear bombs, Gail hands a shiny toaster to her husband, letting him see how the heat from the explosion caused his face to glow red. Rob groans, but then he notices that the situation in the freezer just became worse. The couple stares at it as they hear screams, gunshots, and explosions. With this, Gail closes the freezer and says that the people can't possibly outgrow war in a couple of minutes. Hearing this, Rob asks what they should do, and Gail responds that they should order pizza. Later that night, the couple has pizza for dinner while they wait for the situation to die down. An hour has passed, and Rob recommends that they should check out the freezer. He hopes that the miniature people had a chance to rebuild their city, but Gail gently tells them that they need to embrace the possibility that they didn't make it. Still, Rob goes to the freezer and opens opens it anyway. To their surprise, the freezer glows with luminous cities and flying cars. Gale claims that it looks like the Emerald City, but with less emerald and more futuristic devices. The sight of this makes Rob ecstatic, marveling at how beautiful everything is. Suddenly, a building emerges right in front of them, and Rob jokes that it looks like an adult toy. 
Just then, everything escalates, and a massive pyramid appears in the middle of the futuristic city. It glows brightly and consumes power from the bridges attached to it. Eventually, it turns into a diamond-shaped fortress and consumes the whole city until it bursts into a ball of energy. The majestic energy explodes like a star, and streaks of light begin to zoom around Rob and Gail's kitchen, filling their apartment with light. The wondrous light fascinates them both. During this period, it seems like the miniature people have figured out the secrets to time and space travel. After this, the streaks of light return to the freezer, gather into a sphere, and disappear. This wipes out the smiles on Rob's and Gail's faces, confused at what they just witnessed. Rob wonders if the miniature people will ever return, but Gail thinks it's unlikely. Because of this, Rob mournfully pulls her refrigerator's plug, as if he's accepting that those tiny people will never return. Knowing that Rob has grown fond of the miniature people, Gail hugs him in comfort. She then closes the freezer, deciding to call it a day. The next day, Rob pours her cups of coffee and hands one to Gail. Without saying a word to each other, both wonder about the miniature civilization in their freezer. With the slightest bit of hope that the miniature people are still alive, they open the freezer again to find cold mist pouring out despite it being unplugged. Inside, they witness another ice age where primitive sapiens consume the carcass of a mighty brachiosaurus. It seems like life in the freezer has restarted, and it has now returned to the age of the dinosaurs. Just then, a roar alerts the sapiens of the arriving Tyrannosaurus Rex. The sapiens run as one is caught between the dinosaur's teeth. The last sapiens tumbles with the T-Rex closing in, lunging for the kill. Many claims that the freezer is like a pocket universe that shows how life evolves to the point of leaving reality. Some may think that the freezer showed the end of their world, but it could also mean that the miniature humans found a different dimension to live in. It's uncertain how many times this process of life occurred in the old freezer, or if it always plays out the same way. The previous owners may have seen life bloom and die repeatedly, eventually getting bored of it, thus leaving the extraordinary freezer behind. Although the show never revealed who created life inside the freezer, an episode titled God Serengeti by Oat Studios might just suggest who did. A herd of elephants travels across a field, but their field is on a table in the middle of a mysterious man's study. The old man doesn't pay attention to this, as he he's busy reading a book. His butler, Jeffrey, asks how the book is, and the man comments that it's too technical, adding that he prefers chaos. Still, he likes a recipe for a black hole from the book. He turns his attention to the little beings in his pocket world, and laughs at a miniature man who's rubbing two sticks together. Suddenly, the homo sapien discovers how to make fire, and the old man is enraged. He complains that he didn't say those people could do such a thing because he's supposed to give fire. Jeffrey notes that the current time period is over 200,000 years before they're supposed to give them fire. Because of this, the old man orders Jeffrey to put the fire out, so the butler blows onto the table, creating the wind that snuffs out the flames. Still, the old man is pissed, so he tells Jeffrey to put them back into their caves. The butler obeys, so he triggers the elephants to stampede towards the humans, forcing them to hide. After it's done, Done, the old man is still annoyed at what just happened, so he plans to shrink the brains of the tiny beings to prevent them from making their own choices. Not long after, the homo sapiens exit the cave again to perform a rain dance. Jeffrey reminds him that they haven't turned off the drought, so the old man orders him to spray some water on the parched little things. Jeffrey happily obliges and sprays water over the table, causing it to rain on the field. He comments that their god is merciful as the homo sapiens rejoice. The old man giggles at the sight of their excitement, so he orders his trusty butler to spray more water. As Jeffrey does so, new plants begin to sprout from the little field. Finally, he's had enough of his fun, and the old man tells Jeffrey to release the plague. The butler hesitates, but the old man is adamant about ending this little game. With no choice, Jeffrey opens an antique box and takes a fancy bottle from it. With furrowed brows, Jeffrey sprays this over the homo sapiens, and one by one, the people collapse as they take their final breaths. The old man simply watches this from over his book before continuing with his reading. This story about creation depicts God as both merciful and unforgiving. While he provides water for the thirsty beings on his table, he also takes their lives in a snap once he's tired of watching them. Both Love, Death, and Robots, Ice Age, and God Serengeti present their own versions of godlike beings. Rob and Gale watch life grow and die without intervention, but with sympathy for the civilizations they witness. In contrast, the other presents a more involved god who's apathetic to the lives on his table, treating them as entertainment that he can simply turn off. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like, it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.